Thanks, Elena. And so, yeah, I'm going to give a very brief um, introduction to, to how open source has changed to us recently and some of our kind of early thoughts at Roche on, on how to respond to that. Um, so when I joined uh, six years ago, the pharma industry, open, our relationship with open source kind of could be summarized by this two-way uh, table. So we had things we built. A lot of those were closed source. We kept them internal. And then a few things we kind of threw out into the wild. Um, and a lot of those were kind of statistical packages with maybe one or two authors. Um, we also uh, consumed things. So we consumed proprietary tools like SAS, Spotfire, and things like that. And then we also consumed a lot of open source uh, libraries and including our packages like the Tidyverse. Um, what we've seen happen recently though is that it's got a lot more complicated, but complicated in a good way because we're starting to actually collaborate in the open source setting and also collaborating even more in the, the closed source setting. And um, so this talk is kind of uh, touching on some of the, the issues that we've run into and then what we're doing within Roche to try and respond to that. So the main kind of change that we're talking about here is that it used to be a couple of individuals most times working on a package, usually as part of one of their projects and deciding to push it out and, and open source it. And the kind of fundamental shift we're seeing is that much more business critical um, tools on the pathway to things like submissions are now candidates for being um, open source and particularly collaborations. So we're starting to say, well, actually, we really shouldn't be doing this internally um, 30, 40 times for each company. Why can't we work together on these tools? And there are a whole bunch of different topics under this. I guess the three I want to call out, um, are, this brings us to the question, like what, uh, I think a different slide deck popped up. Okay, um, so what, what are the things we should be prioritizing to be collaborations in terms of, of open source projects? And also what the licenses are, because we were pretty naive to this when we started, but understanding what the licenses are and what protections and ramifications are of choosing a license actually makes it a lot more easy um, to collaborate. And there's a huge elephant in the room, which I, I won't touch on, um, but I think it's something we need to discuss a lot more between companies is how do we do these big open source projects? Um, so we've heard about Admiral and Nest uh, multiple times through this conference, which are, which are big corporate investments with a lot of people and money um, going into them. So in terms of trying to think through like what are the projects that we should kind of aggressively go after as things that we should be collaborating on? Um, so not just open sourcing, but trying to make them things that we build together across companies. We've, within Roche, we've kind of broken it down into these three buckets of IP. So we have a pre-competitive IP, and this was the thing which we're actually quite good at open sourcing here. So there's a lot of statistical packages that come out of pharma, as well as more and more um, packages in the machine learning space. Um, and we also have those kind of implementations, but generalized implementations. So things like annotating um, omics data or generating a scorer in a machine learning model. Then we have our kind of core business, the competitive uh, IP. So how good, how, but it has code underneath that. So code saying how well our drugs work, as well as the code that help us find those molecules in the first place. But the, the area which we've really focused on is this term of post-competitive. So once we have an insight, how do we get it out of the data? So it's been generated by something like a statistical package, and now we want to extract it from the data, get it ready, and in the case of a filing, prepare it for a submission. And in that space, it's quite obvious that there's a lot of opportunities there for us to collaborate and, and work together across the pharma companies. And so the examples talked about at this conference, like Nest and Admiral, T-Player and many others are good examples of that. So then it comes down to like understanding the licenses so we can go into these conversations uh, a little bit better equipped. So something that pops up a lot when you work with R is viral licenses, usually with a bit of fear attached to that term. And it's, it's mostly referring to the, the GPL licenses that R is released under. So these are a copy left, which means if you have a license, sorry, if you generate code and you include that original source code that has the GPL license, you then have to GPL your own code as well. 
Um, so it's not the end of the world. You can still have it as an external dependency that someone using your product has to install and source themselves. Um, but it's probably something we want to avoid when we build uh, packages, which is why we focus a lot. And you see that with MIT and Apache 2.0 um, being the common examples used. And the R package uh, manual um, has some really good summaries there of the different license types specific to R packages. Staying on the theme of licenses, there's kind of two other themes that we've heard pop up in our conversations. So one is the sphere, and this is especially from, from people outside of data science. So we're going to need contracts for everything here. And while I talked about the elephant in the room um, earlier about who owns the, the, the particular R package, who controls the master branch, if we're just talking about accepting code, MIT has provisions implicit and explicit about the patent and the copyright and what happens to that when someone writes code. Apache 2.0 is more explicit on that, but they specifically protect you. They say that if someone is, is pushing their code, doing a pull request into your repository, they're accepting and that code can fall under the license that you've picked. So you're, you're relatively protected there without needing to, to sign you know, contracts between 30 different pharmaceutical companies. And then the other fear is what happens if this closed source project gets unclosed sourced, or they decide to go off in a direction that we disagree with. And again, this is all open source, so that has happened. I think it was Gitbook, which was an example where they decided to take a closed source, but then people can fork it at the point that the license was changed and continue to iterate and build on that original, original permissively licensed uh, copy. So it's not really something to be scared of. So getting to the summary of what we did at Roche. Um, so one of our first things was there was a lot of kind of misinformation happening in terms of what is open source and why are we doing it and what are the benefits and particularly what are the risks. So one of the first things we put together was a guidance on why we open source, um, the types of projects that are appropriate, things like recommending licenses, and then also going through a lot of our open source projects and kind of summarizing you know, here's the project, here's the license it used, here's why we picked that license, and also, most importantly, here's how it's governed. And this is why that particular governance model works, because it's not a one, a one model fits all uh, thing. And this was a, a collaboration between my, our department and legal, and it's also a living document. So just a couple of days ago, um, we were having a discussion with legal to update it based on some questions that had arised. The, the one that we need to solve is that elephant in the room about like what does governance mean? So if we have something that's, that's on the critical path for a submission, most pharma companies are probably going to be a little bit worried about just letting one pharma company take control of it. And so there's been a lot of discussions happening around, well, what are the governance models that work for us? Um, and this is really important when, you know, a lot of these projects, we have budgets for them and we have to yearly apply and extend and, and these budgets. So if we're talking to our senior leaders, in the case of Nest, asking for around 30 people to be invested into this open source project, um, we really do need to, to understand, like, how are we going to govern this and make sure that if we have multiple companies involved, um, all of those companies are getting back what they need in terms of its roadmap and, and uh, evolution over time. And then another piece we're working on is also making it easy from a legal perspective. So often we want to kind of share code. So getting fit for purpose contracts in place to let us kind of quickly shoot closed source propriety code off to people. But then also trying to work out, well, if we do have these kind of structures on top of who controls the master branch, um, between a small group of companies, like what would that contract look like and how can we keep it flexible over time? So that was kind of a quick run through of where we are at the moment uh, at, at Roche. And it's something which is definitely evolving and there's a lot of conversations happening with people here at our pharma that I hope will continue to, to blossom. And I think it's definitely a topic where as we kind of mature on this, um, there's a lot more opportunities to prevent that kind of duplication and, and even though some duplication is always present in open source, there are huge opportunities for us to work together and, and focus our efforts into shared platforms, particularly in that, that post-competitive space where we're taking an insight and preparing it to be shared uh, with our external uh, bodies like the FDA and EMA. So thank you.